today's video we will be talking about the history of IBM. I was planning to make this video for a long time, but ultimately decided to do it because I've seen this whole Microsoft versus Apple debate, and even with Google, and who exactly copied who. And I just thought I'd point out IBM's role in this development, but there were a couple of other things I also were going to include here, which is how IBM really developed computing into how it is now, and how the advertising played a significant role in the multiple way computer race in the 1980s and 1990s. So we're going to be starting though in 1911 with the formation of IBM. This isn't entirely true what I just said, but for the reasons that it's quite complicated to just explain, we're starting in 1911. And the first thing they became notable for after 1911 was their think slogan. Slogan was created by soon to be CEO Thomas J. Watson during a sales meeting in which he said the trouble with every one of us is that we don't think enough. We don't get paid for working with our feet, we get paid for working with our heads. After the speech, Watson wrote Think on an Easel. Think would stay as IBM's motto for over a century. Watson became CEO in 1914, and IBM made a number of innovations in the 1920s with tabulators. One of these tabulators became the origin of the word supercomputer because of how advanced it was. IBM also ended cross-vendor compatibility with tabulators by switching to square holes that they had patented. So yeah, not everything they did was really great. The Great Depression was the first major problem that IBM faced. Watson would choose to continue to produce tabulators for six years despite having no customers. And they also continued to innovate at a rapid rate and research into this, despite there being no customers. If IBM ran out of money, Watson would face a disaster, as the company would be impossible to sell, as this was the Great Depression. However, in 1935, Watson's plan succeeded when the Social Security Act, known as the largest accounting operation in history, began. By 1939, IBM had reached the top of the industry. IBM had now made some quite controversial moves by selling machines to the Nazis that became very critical in documenting Jews during the Holocaust. However, IBM was far from the only company to sell stuff to the Nazis. For example, Donald Trump became partially why he became rich was because his grandfather sold weapons to the Nazis. And Ford also ended up suing the U.S. Army for bombing their German tank factories that were making tanks for the Nazis. There are a lot of other companies that did this, but I don't have time to list them all, obviously. After World War II, IBM was the leading company in computing. IBM's first proper computer was the Selective Sequence Electronic Calculator, or SSEC. It was notable at the time for its lack of cables and being a much cleaner design than contemporary computers. Despite being good enough for its time, the SSEC quickly became obsolete due to rapid advances in technology. IBM's next major computer was the IBM 701. It was released alongside the business-oriented IBM 702 and the lower-cost IBM 650. Watson went to 20 companies to find customers and said, As a result of our trip on which we expected to get orders for five machines, we came home with orders for 18. Its successor would be the IBM 704. The IBM 704 was considered to be the only computer that could handle complex math when it was released. 140 IBM 704s were sold by 1960. T.J. Watson Sr. stepped down as CEO in 1952, and T.J. Watson Jr. became the new CEO. IBM invented the first AI in 1950, which was designed to play checkers. It was also the first computer to sing a song. Here is that song.
IBM also introduced the RAM Act in 1956. This was the first magnetic hard drive ever made, and it cost about $10,000 per megabyte and could be up to 5 megabytes. IBM also invented Fortran in 1957, and this quickly became the most popular programming language in the world. Then in 1959, IBM introduced the IBM 1401, which became the most popular computer available in the early 1960s. IBM also released the IBM 1403, which was unrivaled in printer quality until laser printing became available in the mid-1970s. On April 7, 1964, IBM would introduce the System 360 that would forever change computing. The System 360 introduced interchangeable software and peripherals. This went hand-in-hand -hand with the invention of the first operating system, CPM. This was a massive innovation, as now, instead of software only running on one specific computer, it could now run on many computers, the same program. This is, of course, how computers work now, but previously, computers did not work like that. Then in 1969, the U.S. government would begin a 13-year antitrust lawsuit that would become a fruitless war of attrition that the government would finally give up on in 1982. IBM computers would also be critical in making the moon landings possible. In 1970, IBM made the System 370, the successor to the System 360. In 1971, IBM made the first floppy disk, which was easily portable and could store a significant amount of data. Floppy disks are still able to store some amount of data, and, for example, the script to this video could be easily stored on a floppy disk. In the mid-1970s, IBM began to slip up and made a mistake in which it failed to identify the growing pocket computer market. The ongoing lawsuit likely affected this. IBM wanted to avoid the same thing happening with the personal computer market, but leadership was no longer as good as it used to be, and Apple was able to beat IBM to making the first personal computer. IBM then made its first computer, the IBM PC 5150. It had most of the desirable aspects of a computer and was at a semi-affordable price. Most computers being sold to this day are IBM compatible. One of the most important parts of the IBM PC was the basic input-output system, or BIOS. IBM had to find a new operating system for its new computer. They initially planned to use CPM, but following a number of blunders by Gary Kildall and just some bad luck, used MS-DOS from Microsoft instead. Now the major computer companies began a battle for supremacy. The contenders were DEC, a company who had rivaled IBM in the 1970s, so it was falling apart by 1981. Atari who had begun producing personal computers in 1979, was experiencing success in the industry. Apple, which had began when Steve Jobs sold his minibus to pay for the Apple I, and was now producing Apple IIs, which were slowly becoming more and more popular. Commodore had made the world's best-selling desktop computer in 1982, and Microsoft, who had bought a stolen operating system and following extreme amounts of luck, sold it to IBM. And then, of course, there was IBM. IBM, with its massive experience in computers, began to gain increasingly, increasingly influence in the market. By 1985, there was a problem. In IBM's race to make a PC, it had used non-IBM parts and only had its BIOS to prevent cloning. However, Phoenix was able to reverse engineer it and create Phoenix BIOS. The second problem was that Bill Gates had sneakily made IBM allow DOS to be sold to other companies. This opened the door for the first IBM PC clone, the MPC-1600. Keep in mind that all IBM clones were copied from IBM. The clone market, exploding compact in particular, became a problem. IBM, however, had a plan to recover control over the PC market. IBM would make its own OS with Microsoft finally shut down the clone industry. However, Apple and Atari now had graphical interfaces, so OS 2, IBM's new OS, would also need one. The Macintosh, which used the GUI purchase from Xerox, had become very successful in particular. They had also, however, become successful via one of their ads, which I'm going to take a little bit of time to explain about how this ad worked now. This is also, by the way, the ad that led to many companies 
advertising at the Super Bowl in the future. So as you can see that there are these people walking down, this is supposed to represent IBM and how they held a monopoly over computing. Well, they didn't really hold a complete monopoly over it. And you can see on this person that there is the outline of the Macintosh on her shirt. She's also supposed to, she's also an athlete because to say that this Apple computer is very powerful. And you can see that this has a blue glow on the TV because that TVs like that didn't have a blue glow. The blue glow is to represent IBM further. You can also see that the people are now no longer influenced by IBM. They no longer have the blue glow on their places. And you'll see so yeah, that's kind of how that ad works. Like IBM Microsoft cooperation ended after Microsoft refused to sell Windows 3.0 to IBM. It was now game on. IBM began to develop OS 2 2.0 as Microsoft had helped develop version 1.0 and its basic GUI, which they now needed. However, IBM massively rewrote OS 2 to make OS 2.0 without Microsoft's help. Meanwhile, Microsoft made Windows 3.1 to move it further away from OS 2. However, Microsoft and IBM both had access to each other's old code from 1990 and previously. This meant that OS 2 became compatible with Windows 3.0, and it could actually run all programs for Windows basically seamlessly in OS 2. Unfortunately, this meant that it would not have any programs natively designed for it. Well, with Windows, it did have programs and everything was designed for it, because why make software for OS 2 when you can make it for Windows and it will run on both Windows and OS 2 just fine? Then Microsoft planned to deal the final blow with Windows Chicago, which would become Windows 95. IBM watched OS 2 3.0, hoping that they could save themselves. However, this once again failed. This went and took Atari and Commodore out of the computer industry and almost destroyed Apple entirely. It was also very bad for IBM. For IBM did have one final plan that they would do. It was to team up with everyone left in the computing industry that wouldn't work with Microsoft and crush Microsoft and the companies that would work with them. This led to AIM, which was the alliance between Apple, IBM, and Motorola. First company to crush was Intel, and being along with a company called Sun had developed Risk, which reduced complicated instructions for CPUs and was more efficient than Intel. IBM would make a new OS for its new Risk CPU. Polar PC became that new Risk CPU, and Workplace OS became the OS. But this never really got finished. Even OS 2 wasn't really properly ported. There was a part made, but it was sent. It was far from being finished. They ultimately completed OS 2.4.0, which solved many of the bugs in Warp 3, but it was too late. Windows 9.5 had already caught on, and Windows programs could no longer run on OS 2. Then, things just continued to go downhill. Windows NT, however, had also been developed from OS 2. It would ultimately become Windows XP and even to Windows 10. So Windows this day is actually based off of OS 2. And then we also have iOS and Android, which everything they run on is based off of RISC, which was developed from IBM. What's very surprising is just how much success that this has had, even to the present day. And a lot of computers, like all computers basically, are based off of IBM since they had to use a RISC CPU or they are still IBM compatible in the first place. Anyway, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. Bang. There's a grilling store for all to hear about the post, the corporations and the rest of the land. We're here to cheer and pioneer and all the proudly boast of that man, a man, a friend and guiding hand. The name of T.J. Watson means the courage not contempt, and we feel honored to be here to help the effort for it. Ever onward, ever onward, that spirit that has brought us
never fall. But here and now we thankfully fight the